You're a mess. Oh, you're late again. <laughs> Come on, get up. Did you get ready yourself this morning or what? Come on. <laughs> All right, you're stepping over. Come on. Going forward here. You're such a liar. I was young once myself. You used to spell sin, F-U-N. I love you, you know that, don't you? Just remember, it's not what you can bring to the table, but what you can. I'm sorry, Grandpa. What are you doing here? Shouldn't I be asking you that? What? You gonna spank me? You kick someone out of their own home? You'll lose that privilege. I did not kick you out! <laughs> Well, then you shouldn't have a problem watching me leave again. Have you seen Chad lately? Just now, actually. Really? I must have just missed him. He looks real good. <laughs> Come here, I want to see you. You know he dropped out. He brings me lunch. He graffitied up the church. I called the police this time. You're getting wrinkles. He's ruining my congregation. When did you go blind? Sorry. Uh, please stand as you are able to and join me for the call to worship and opening prayer. Welcome, beloved. Why have you gathered today? Welcome, beloved. Do you? What do you seek from God, our Creator? Are you ready to follow when God's wisdom leads down unexpected paths? Well then, beloved of God, what are you waiting for? Join me in the prayer, please. The rich and poor have leads in common. The creator is maker of them all. A good name is to be chosen over riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and poor have this in common. The holy one is maker of them all. The rich rule over the poor, and borrowers are slave to lenders.
Those who are generous are blessed, for they share bread with the poor. Oppressed in the poor in order to become rich and give in to the rich will lead only, only to loss. May you know that your trust should be in God. Yes, your trust in the God of heaven. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. May be seated.
All right, I'll read him from the Gospel of Mark 7, 24 to 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for he, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat, he spat and touched his tongue. Then he look, looking up to heaven, he sighed, and said to him, Epatha, that, that is, be opened. And immediately his, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more that zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The word of God for the people of God. As we come now to our time of prayer, I will ask you to mention any names that you would like us to bring forward who need special prayers. Sally. I have prayers for Ed Harvey, who will be hopefully getting out of the hospital today. Thank you, Sally. Anyone else? Okay then, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you today knowing that we so often fail and fall short of your call for us to love one another. We've allowed ourselves to be blinded by wealth and power, and too often we ignore those people around us who suffer injustice poverty and rejection. Help us to see your great generosity, to hear your words of mercy, 
and feel your great love for all who need your loving grace. Strengthen us as we reach out in service to those who are in need. Make us aware of those outside of our own inner circles, that we may see them as your precious children and serve them in humility and joy. And today we ask for your special blessings on Ed Harvey, who is in the hospital and had an incident while he was in the valley. Lord, we ask that you would be with him to heal him and give him the strength that he needs to carry on. And Lord, this morning I also ask for prayers for my daughter Christine, who is continuing to suffer from illnesses, some that are unknown. Lord, we ask for your healing, your intervention, and comfort. And we ask these things this day and every day in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm asking the question to all of you, how do we react when God seems to be unfair? Do we react with anger, impatience, or do we persevere with humility and trust? So the woman in the scripture passage knelt before Jesus in an attitude of utter desperation. Now, the people surrounding Jesus may have thought, oh, isn't it enough that Tyre consumes all the food that we grow in Galilee? Isn't it enough that the Jewish children go hungry to feed this city's wealthy people? What nerve, they're probably thinking, asking him for help. Jesus isn't going to do what she asks. But wait a minute. Jesus always responds. Jesus doesn't buy into the local feuds or the party line. Jesus talks to tax collectors. And Jesus touches lepers. Jesus always does the surprising thing. So... I mean, we might wonder what's going on here. It does seem like Jesus responds negatively to her request. She is a Gentile. But really, that's never stopped Jesus from healing before. So I wonder, were his words for the benefit of those people who were following him? I think we might ask ourselves how we handle the mystery of God's seeming injustice when life deals us a bad hand. How do you respond to the mystery of God's apparent silence when you cry out for relief? Do you react with anger or bitterness? Do you turn your back on God? or take matters into your own hands, or, or maybe seek other gods that promise to do your bidding more quickly and more to your liking? 
or do you persevere with humility, hope, and trust, just as the woman does? Now, none of us really knows why Jesus said the things to her that he did. The text doesn't tell us. But then we will not always know why God acts as God does. Sometimes God will give us answers to our questions. But sometimes we don't get those answers. It's nice, isn't it, to know why bad things happen? But it's really not necessary. We simply have to start with the idea that God is good, and Jesus is good, too. What's necessary for us to know is how we are supposed to act. And I think that's what we can learn from this story about the woman. The first thing she does is accept the fact that she doesn't have any rights. When Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, she accepts her status. She doesn't have a right to attention from any Jewish healer. She's not entitled to any favors from this man. She wasn't born into this favored class, and she hadn't earned any kind of special consideration. Guess what? We don't have any rights either where God is concerned. Sometimes, though, we do talk as if we do, because we really are accustomed to our privileges, aren't we? Everything we have been given is because God is good, not because we are deserving. And so Jesus does heal the woman's daughter. He doesn't commend her, but he does grant her healing. And then from Tyre, Jesus heads off to the region of the Decapolis, again, a Gentile territory. I think maybe he's still looking to escape from all the notice, and maybe rest a little bit. Or maybe he has a vision that is new for his mission that goes beyond the borders of his home territory. In any case, avoiding notice is, proves to be impossible. As they brought him a deaf man who also had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Well, like the woman, the man is also an outsider. He's cut off from the world by his inability to hear and, and communicate with other people. This time, Jesus doesn't hesitate to respond to this man's desperate request. Although, he does take that man aside, away from the crowd. Then Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears, spits and touches the man's tongue, and then says an Aramaic word, which I know I can't pronounce, which means be open. Be open. And immediately the man's ears were open and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Suddenly, this man is able to hear and communicate with people around him. Not only is he physically healed, but now he's also restored to his community. So this passage in the Gospel of Mark presents to us some very strange events. Jesus shows an unwillingness to respond to a request for healing because the woman doesn't measure up to the standards of his followers. And yet he does heal. 
Then Jesus encounters a person in need of healing, and he shows a willingness to heal, but he has to take the man out of sight. He doesn't want the other people to see. Why would he do that? I think maybe Jesus realizes that the crowd is very judgmental about who's worthy of God's grace. Is that something that we ever feel? Earlier in the service, we saw a video that mirrors these events that might be common in today's world. There's a young man whose behavior and lifestyle just doesn't meet the standards of the culture. Not the culture we live in, right? He's damaged that building of the church where his father is the pastor. And he lives an erratic and unclean lifestyle. But he's the one who lovingly goes to meet with his grandfather every day. Now, this young man's father would have been greatly respected in the community for his status and his clean behavior. Yet, that pastor shows no love. Yeah, there are even pastors who fail to show love. And the son does the best he can to try to correct the situation that he's created. He apologizes. And his apology isn't even accepted. So I ask you the question today, which of these men mirrors the image of Jesus? There are times that we think we're being righteous and good, but we're really not. There may be times when we feel like we're worthy and others are not. Remember that question we used to ask ourselves? What would Jesus do? Why did we stop wondering that? We live in a world that's God's world. And Jesus was set to be an example to us. So may we go into the world remembering that none of us are worthy only God is worthy. We're simply his children who receive his blessing. So let's open our eyes to the blessings that do surround us. Amen.
now to that time of worship where we give back to the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Ushers. pray with me. Loving Creator, we dedicate these offerings with hearts guarded by your wisdom and grace. As we gather on this September Sunday, may our gifts embody the teachings of Proverbs, spreading honor, kindness, and justice to all. Use these offerings to uplift those in need, fostering hope and peace in our community. May we live out your wisdom in our actions and generosity. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And I'll receive the blessing. May God bless you today and all days to notice the needs all around you and to share in the work of nurturing abundant life for all of God's creation. Go in the name of Jesus. Amen.